welcome to Nerds at Church, a podcast about nerdery and the Bible. I'm Pastor Emily, and I use pronouns like they, them, theirs. And I'm Pastor Kay, and my pronouns are she, her. In this episode, we'll discuss Easter Sunday, which this year falls on April 17th. Check out the episode description for links to the Bible passages and other references we make in this episode. So our deep dive for today is on the Easter Vigil which is a worship service you may or may not have heard of. Uh, It's one that is, I would say, largely celebrated by region rather than by denomination. It it definitely crosses a lot of denominations, Uh, but I think it tends to be... I was thinking by liturgical level. So folks who are higher liturgy or from denominations like the Episcopal Church that are higher liturgy are more likely to do a vigil. That too, yeah. Basically, if one church starts to do a vigil and the other churches in the area notice and think it's awesome, it tends to spread (laughs) because Mm -hmm. vigils are awesome. And Mm -hmm. I would also say it requires a certain amount of layperson buy-in. Like, Mm. one clergy person cannot pull this off on their own. You need a bunch of people involved. And uh, if there's a lot of people involved and they're all passionate about it, it can be a great time. Uh, If Mm -hmm. not, It's going to add a lot to your Holy Week, Uh, but Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of work. uh, But the Easter Vigil, also known as the Paschal Vigil or the Great Vigil of Easter, uh, is a worship service that sort of tells the story of God and humanity and humanity's salvation. So why Mm -hmm. would you have an Easter Vigil? Well, uh, it's an additional service during Holy Week. It's held on Holy Saturday, and it's a acknowledgement of the time between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, uh, that time of waiting, that time of, technically speaking, we don't know what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And the acknowledgement that one of the best things that we can do when we wait is to tell stories of what's happened before. Uh, And uh, those stories can be incredibly comforting and also interesting and educational. Uh, And depending on the vigil you go to, they might also be kind of silly, which can be a good time. (laughs) Those are the best kind, in my opinion. Yes. So when I learned about the Easter vigil in seminary, the framing for it was the Easter vigil is like waiting up with the disciples late night. And a sunrise service would be getting up early with the women. One of those is actually depicted in the Bible. (laughs) And it's not the one with the men. And also, the Easter Vigil can be really powerful. One of the things that I will say is, while the Easter Vigil usually takes place at night, I actually really love it as a sunrise service itself. So you actually start in the dark and then move into the sun rising. That's what we did for my internship congregation, and I really appreciated that. But I also come from the mountains where... Sunrise service on top of the mountain on Easter morning is just, like, nearly impossible to beat. Sure. Because, yeah. And the Easter Vigil service focuses on telling the salvation stories of God found throughout the Bible. And by golly, there are an awful lot of them. And uh, depending on which Easter Vigil service you go to, it might tell a lot of them. Uh, There can be quite a few readings involved in this service. It's true. There can be a lot, and there might not be. The general pattern of the liturgy follows the kind of big picture, gather, word, meal, send, but has some changes in how it is done. You have like the gathering and a greeting, usually with a little bit of like, hey, this is what we're doing. And then there's the lighting of the Paschal candle. And so the new fire is lit as like potentially a bonfire if you want. And then the Paschal candle, so like the big candle that gets lit for baptisms and for Easter and for kind of the special, special Sundays, gets marked with with a cross, with Alpha and Omega, with the year, those sorts of things as a way of like marking this is for this coming year. And then there's a procession with it and a proclamation. One of the phrases that you'll hear during the Easter Vigil is, this is the night. This is the night. So there's a lot of repetition of this is the night and a building of sus- suspense in that sort of way. Dramatic tension. Mm-hmm. There's sometimes 
Like when I was in seminary, we did it with a local congregation. And so we would actually start in the seminary sanctuary and do a Thanksgiving for baptism and do the readings there and then move while doing a chanting of like an All Saints liturgy, then move to the congregation's building and go in with a very like triumphant, the brass and the lights and all of those things for for the like gospel and sermon and all of those pieces. So you can have like a, lit- a litany of saints. You can have a lot of people will do baptisms. So a lot of uh, pastors' kids who were born while their parents were in seminary probably got baptized at the Easter vigil, if that was at all around the realm of time. But it also has like the usual elements of passing of the peace, prayers of the people, a meal, offering communion, benedictions, cool. that sort of thing. Some people will have like extra special delightful communion. So angel food cake or champagne as like some of the options. And some people don't. And afterwards, there's usually kind of some version of extra fellowship. So it could be a chocolate fountain. It could be just like a potluck type thing. It could be special desserts, kind of whatever you want. But the the point is to celebrate the specialness of the day. Cool. And there are quite a variety of readings, uh, and we will just go through those for you to give you an idea of the storyline that the evening follows. Mm-hmm. Also, within that, so you're not required to do all of the readings. That would be a lot, and it would be great if you had fun with them. Some places will do these readings instead of just reading them out of the Bible, we'll do them as skits or as dioramas or as uh, tableau. There's various ways of doing them. Sometimes you will read the reading and then do the skit. Uh, It varies. Mm -hmm. Uh, If there is a skit, there's usually some wackiness going on because, you know, why wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Well, and Pastor John Michael Longworth did an online Easter vigil last year I think that's really beautiful that we can link to but part of that was that it gets there's so much more you can do and a lot of times we think that we have to read the bible story verbatim in whatever translation we're given but the reality is in order to be the storytelling that Kay you talked about you don't want to just read the story verbatim if you read Daniel verbatim it's going to be really boring yeah like It's intended to be an oral storytelling interactive thing. And so there are a lot more ways to do that. And there are a couple different models of the Easter Vigil that have different required readings. So we are not using the Catholic version. We are not using the Catholic version. That might surprise you. I don't know. But in the lectionaries that we generally use, you are required to have at least three Hebrew Bible readings. And one of them has to be Exodus 14 which is the story of deliverance through the Red Sea, in the ELCA and in our hymnal, the Evangelical Lutheran Worship Hymnal, ELW, you're required to do the Genesis 1 creation account, Exodus 14, the deliverance through the Red Sea, and Isaiah 55, which is an invitation to abundance. I thought you were also required to do Daniel, but I couldn't find that. So I mean, why would you have an Easter vigil and not do Daniel? It's right? one of the It's most all fun. about the fire. Yeah. Anyway, so, and each of the readings has a response, usually a psalm, but not always a psalm. So we'll go through it. Yeah, we're not, we're not going to describe all of the psalms because there's a lot of them and that would take quite a while. We'll just list them for you uh, in mm-hmm. case you're curious. So the first reading for the Easter Vigil service, uh, according to the model that we're used to, is from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, which is the first verse of the Bible, so you shouldn't have too much trouble finding it, uh-huh. to Chapter 2, verse 4a. The story of God's creation of the cosmos is told through a seven-day framework, with God proclaiming of each new creation that it is good. And there are lots of creative ways to uh, to tell this story. Not all of them have to involve Muppets, but some of them could. Mm-hmm. But I particularly uh, have heard stories of people telling this story with uh, various like balls and items that characterize the different things that are being created a a ball that like maybe a beach ball that looks like the planet earth Mm -hmm. and the clouds and the mountains and seas and so forth being stuck to it throughout the story uh, is one option Uh, 
Uh, and the response to that is Psalm 136, verse 1 through 9, and ver- verses 23 through 26. The next reading is Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, and 11 through 18, chapter 8, verses 6 through 18, and chapter 9, verses 8 through 13. God destroys all of humanity save one family, realizes it was a mistake, and, hanging up God's bow, promises never to do it again. The rainbow remains a reminder for God of this promise. Some people just like to call it Noah and the Flood, Um, but perspective is fun to have. Yes. So the response that's used for this one is Psalm 46, which is pretty familiar to a lot of people. Um, This has the be still and know that I am God. It has uh, the God of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Some of those like key lines. And a mighty fortress. And a mighty fortress for you Lutherans out there or Lutheran adjacent folk. I I have heard that people other than Lutherans do sing that hymn occasionally. It's true. And I've heard that sometimes people from other denominations will sing it on Reformation Sunday just for like the like a nudge to the Lutherans. That's very sweet. Mm -hmm. And the next reading that's an option is from Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 through 18. Uh, In a passage that we have always struggled to understand, God tests Abraham by making him believe that he's going to have to sacrifice his son Isaac before instead providing a ram to sacrifice and blessing Abraham for his obedience. This one does not lend itself toward cartoony or Muppet-like telling quite as well. I think that most of the people I know who have actually told this story in a vigil, the emphasis is on making it clear that God does not condone child abuse. God does not condone human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. This is a super complicated story. I know that Rabbi Rutenberg on Twitter has recently, uh, fairly recently done a column on it that was quite Mm. lovely. We'll try and find that. And we'll try and find that for you. And then the response to that story is Psalm 16. And then the required, no matter who you are or where you are, passage is Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 31, and chapter 15, verses 20 through 21. God brings the Israelites safely and dryly through the Red Sea before flooding it again to kill the Egyptians. The prophet Miriam responds by leading the Israelites in a song of praise and thanksgiving. And the response to this passage it comes also from exodus it's exodus chapter 15 verses 1b through 13 and 17 through 18 so it is part of the song of gratitude and praise to god for saving them sure and the reading after the story of the red sea which is required for many people is from isaiah chapter 55 verses 1 through 11 the prophet isaiah announces to the people that god invites all to god's abundant wisdom leading to joy and prosperity i could also swear we've heard this passage recently Mm -hmm. yeah it's one of my readings from my ordination so i always pay attention to when it's read most recently we heard verses one through nine though Yes, because I made the Brigadoon reference. Right. And that passage is a lovely passage that you've probably heard before about come to the waters, uh, eat and drink without money and without price Mm -hmm. and so forth. And that one is not exactly a story, but you can still certainly use props to tell it if you want. And the response to that is from Isaiah chapter 12, verses 2 through 6. And then the next reading that is suggested is... Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 through 8, verses 19 through 21, and chapter 9, verses 4b through 6. God's wisdom, personified as woman wisdom, invites all to partake in her gifts. You can alternatively use Baruch chapter 3, verses 9 through 15, and chapter 3, verse 32 through chapter 4, verse 4, which also depicts the wisdom of God. Baruch is in what we call the Apocrypha. Which is awesome, but also requires some education. Yeah, so it's not something that Lutherans typically use all that often. Catholics use it a lot, but feel free to check it out. It's included in the link that we will have in the show notes that has all of these readings actually linked out. 
if you have a person in your life who is terribly bored by the Bible and who you cannot get to read the Bible for any possible reason, allowing them to discover the existence of the Apocrypha and these hidden books that have been kept from them uh, can occasionally <laughs> help raise an interest level. I'm just saying. Although that really only works with Protestants because Catholics and Orthodox folks are very big on these books. So, And then the response to whichever passage you choose is Psalm 19. The next passage, which is optional, is from Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 24 through 28. God promises to gather, cleanse, and give new life to all God's people. Now, this passage is not quite as famous as the next passage from Ezekiel we will be hearing about in a moment, and does not exactly lend itself to, like, uh, skit-oriented storytelling, mm -hmm. but uh, you can still have fun with it by, say, uh, turning it into some kind of a litany um, or having some kind of audience participation. I also, when I did it in seminary, I had an actual stone heart that I just, like, I think my mom got it for me sometime. It's oh, part cool. part memory, like, sure. anxiety stone and part paperweight or whatever, and it says sure. joy on it. So I actually, like, had that, and, and then when it was, give me a new heart, a heart of flesh and not of stone, I dropped it in the baptismal font. Cool. So you can do that. You can use props and that sort of yeah. thing. And the response to that is Psalm 42 and 43. Which are, depending on what you read, actually intended to be one psalm, yeah. not two separate ones. And then the other Ezekiel reading for the Easter Vigil is Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14, which is fairly well known, and we've read it. I think we had it on the podcast for All Saints Day, maybe? that sound right? Uh, very possible, yes. Yeah, I think that we did it for right. All Saints Day. Ezekiel witnesses God bring flesh and new life to dry bones in a valley left from a battle long ago. So, the valley of dry bones. And the response to that passage is Psalm 143. I suppose you don't have to sing the children's song for that <laughs> passage, but like, why wouldn't you... So. I don't know if it's a children's song. Okay, here's a like thing that gets complicated. Some children's songs in white, predominantly white churches, are actually African American spirituals. Oh, yeah, but they're that's, that's easier true. to sing. They're intended to be easier to sing and an easier pattern and that sort of thing, so that they're catchy and people can remember them. Yes, and so they frequently like the number of camp songs that I look back on and I'm like, oh, yeah. That was an African American spiritual that we totally campified, and that's complicated. So maybe learn how to sing them in context and with yeah. the. Yeah. So it is a great song. Make sure you know the context. Sure. But that would be a great op option if it if the context fits to do that. Yes. Song. Uh, and the following reading uh, is from Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Zephaniah calls God's people to rejoice at their deliverance. Uh, and looking at this reading, uh, it does start off by talking about singing, and there's lots of talk of celebration and joy. I would definitely suggest this is a nice spot for a music break, um, and, you know, lots of uh, noisemakers and uh, trumpets Thanks, or whatever party. you have, have on hand. Uh, absolutely. So uh, have a good time with that. And then the response for that is Psalm 98. Who doesn't want to lift up your voice, rejoice, and sing? Especially when you can dance while you do it. Dancing is like singing for the rest of your body. Sure, I could see that. The next reading is Jonah chapter 1 verse 1 through chapter 2 verse 1. Jonah, chosen by God to call the people of Nineveh to repentance, instead runs the opposite direction and gets on a boat to Tarshish. God calls up a storm, and Jonah throws himself overboard to save his shipmates and spends three days in the belly of a great sea creature before being vomited up on shore, reminding us that while God may save your life, you might not enjoy it much. <laughs> I, I may have gotten a little overboard with that. So yeah, but I like See what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. I know a number of people who will be... Um, thoroughly groaning about <laughs> that one, and I appreciate it a lot. Also, the one of the things about the story of Jonah that I love, and because Jonah doesn't come up too much, though we 
did dive into Jonah and process theology last year during Epiphany with, with River Needham. Um, Jonah is satire, right? So this whole thing, the yep. worst character, the one who follows God the least and does the worst things is Jonah, the prophet of God. So yeah. that's always just a fun, a fun thing. By all means, ham it up. Yeah. yeah. And the response to that is Jonah chapter two, verses two through three and seven through nine, though some people will also include four through six to make it just Jonah two, two through nine. And that's the prayer of Jonah, I think, in the belly of the great big fish. Yes, where he admits that probably listening to God is a good plan. You know, yeah. Occasionally. The next reading is from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4 and 9 through 11. The Spirit of God is upon Isaiah, who proclaims liberation and healing to God's people, which may not make you think that you've heard it before, but this is the one that starts with, uh, the Lord has anointed me, he has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, mm-hmm. to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and so on. Uh, all kinds of which stuff. Which Jesus quotes. Yes, absolutely. So there's that. There's a bunch of joyful stuff in here. It's about rejoicing and exulting, and uh, there's some uh, fun stuff about uh, dressing up real pretty uh, at the end uh, as a way of celebrating. And so uh, there are various ways you can enjoy that. And I think also a a reference to uh, successful gardening at the end, too. So you've got lots of options to go with. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the response for that is from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 4, verse 7, verse 36a, and verse 43a. Because who doesn't like to be complicated and cherry pick their Bible verses? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, this is one of those moments when we just look at the lectionary folks and say, really? But Mm -hmm. I think it's more common when it's like us intended to be a like sung response. That would make sense. Not all of Deuteronomy is like in verse. You singing. could sing Deuteronomy, yeah. all of it, especially in the original Hebrew. But in general, it's not all something you want to sing. Especially once it's been translated into another language from two thousand years later, with completely different roots and the grammar is mm-hmm. all different. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And then the final Hebrew Bible reading that I thought was required, but apparently is not, is Daniel chapter three, verses one through twenty-nine. In an over-the-top account, King Nebuchadnezzar demands worship from all the people, and when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Jewish refugees who have been brought into this exile, refuse, the king throws them in the fiery furnace where they survive and dance with a fourth figure. King Nebuchadnezzar partially realizes the error in his ways and demands everyone now worship the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So still demanding everyone worship who he wants them to worship, but at least it's not him. Baby steps, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. When I was on internship for my internship project, I did the Easter vigil through the lens of stewardship during the like Lenten midweek services. So a different person from the congregation did each of the, like talked about each of the passages during the week. And then that person read them at the Easter vigil, which was a sunrise service for us. And Some people got really into it and some people didn't. This is one of those passages that you really have to get into for it to actually, like, work. Well, because the whole thing, like, there's such repetition where you say multiple times over, King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, (laughs) the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces. Like, you repeat that phrasing multiple times, and then you also repeat the phrasing of when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So, like, both of those, if you are just reading it like you would on your average, during your average worship, it's going to be boring. Yes. Yes. But if you get into it, if you give people those instruments or if you have people chant them out with you, it's significantly more interesting. Divide the group that you're with in half. Have half of them practice uh, one of those repetitious things 
several times, have the other half practice the other repetitious thing several times, and then they each get to do those when the time comes up. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have them say it, especially uh, in a high voice, or especially in a low voice, or especially fast, or especially slowly, uh, that can also bring a slightly different energy to the situation. And you can definitely get the kids involved and have the kids help decide, are we going to do it fast or slow or high or low? And as we normally advocate, don't pick the men doing one and the women doing the other because you're creating a false binary and alienating a lot of trans people. You could do sure. left side and right side. Or what is probably better because you're probably facing a different direction than the people you're talking to, depending on if you're a reader or in the congregation, you could do the side with perhaps a piano or an organ or a guitar and the side not. Yes. Something or like you that. have two leaders and each one has a side. Ooh, but you if you don't get to do the chainsaw action of sawing your congregation in half at least once during every service, <laughs> then what's the fun? <laughs> exactly. Um, and the response to Daniel is the song of the three, 35 through 65. So that, I think, again, is in the Apocrypha. Yes. So have fun with that it's a a a lengthy song but it's a lot like the repetition in it is bless the lord light and darkness sing praise to god and highly exalt god forever bless the lord nights and days sing praise to god and highly exalt god forever so there's a lot of repetition but yes and with that we are finished with the readings from the hebrew scriptures and uh then we just have the epistle and the gospel reading and these do not have response Mm -hmm. So the epistle reading for the Easter Vigil is from Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 11. Through baptism, we are united to Christ in death, with the hope of being united also in the resurrection. Uh, And for Lutherans in particular, this passage forms a lot of our liturgy for our funeral services. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it will sound very familiar to those who have been to Lutheran funerals. Um, Mm -hmm. And I know that other denominations also use this very thoroughly in their funerals. It's a common funeral reading. And while it's about death, ultimately speaking, it's about salvation and eternal life. And so this is a very hopeful, very joyous passage that that does acknowledge the reality of grief. Mm -hmm. And then the gospel reading for the Easter Vigil, just as with Monday, Thursday and Good Friday, comes from John. While I and many tend to use whatever the synoptic assigned for the year is for like Palm Sunday and maybe even for Easter Sunday, the Easter Vigil, the the three days, the Triduum are all like kind of called Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil are all part of the, the three days or the Triduum. Those tend to always be the Gospel of John, as is the second Sunday of Easter. Yeah. You will probably hear John if you're at an Easter Vigil, though you never know. We did John, and I actually preached it as a first-person account from Mary's perspective. So I think my first time not using a manuscript and doing something like that was a lot harder to practice for. Sure. So the creativity doesn't have to stop just because we're not in the Hebrew Bible anymore. Right. Uh, But so the gospel reading is John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Mary Magdalene, discovering Jesus' empty tomb, is believed by Peter and the disciple Jesus loved, who look for themselves and then leave. She stays and has a con- Mary stays and has a conversation with two angels, and then Jesus, who she at first mistakes for a gardener, until Jesus calls her by name. So I particularly love the piece of her being called by name, but one thing that we will talk more about, I'm sure, in our later passages in is John, as well as all of the gospel accounts in the Bible, have women as the first witnesses of the resurrection. Women as the ones who actually make up the church. For a while, the church is only women. There are no men in the church. And then they tell the disciples. Because that's probably fair. You know, I guess they could (laughs) know. Yeah, The Easter Vigil is really fun. I think my favorite accounting of these like my favorite way somebody read the easter vigil in an in-person setting was on internship i had an artist do the first creation account and i had been thinking about it as like care of create stewardship of creation and he 
in Lent interpreted it as the we are made in God's image and the image we have of God in Genesis 1, the only image we have is as creator. And so we are made in the image of a creator. So we are like stewardship of creativity, which is really cool. And then when he read, there was a balcony. And so everything was set up. It was really dark. There was just a little bit of light at the mic. And he instead stood behind and up in the balcony where nobody could see him and then read into the darkness, Genesis 1. Excellent. Really cool. Do you have any, like, fun ways that you've seen any of these passages, John? I would definitely say that the exciting parts for me are of any Bible passage is when fire shows up. And so when it comes to uh, Daniel and uh, and the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which, by the way, is absolutely uh, one of my life goals is to have a set of three cats with those names. <laughs> Uh, I I think that when you are portraying fire uh, in a uh, building, uh, especially a building that is not, you know, designed for fire to be inside of, like if you're not dealing with a fireplace, uh, mm-hmm. one of the safest ways to do so is with felt instead of with actual fire. And so uh, making orange and red uh, and uh, and perhaps even the occasional blue flame out of mm. felt uh, and having those uh, dance around, uh, possibly propelled by various uh, members of your congregation. Doesn't have to be children. Older people <laughs> like to have fun, too. And that can be a, a fun way to illustrate that. That does sound like fun. Or having perhaps Muppets. Spoilers. We'll get to the Muppets. Yes, music. Let's absolutely. get the Muppets musical later, but... Also, just so you all know, we will link to, for the passages that we've already covered in one of our episodes, we'll include a link to those episodes so that if you want to dive deep deeper into those passages, you can. It'll just sure. take a little bit. They'll, they're in the Hebrew Bible, so they're the first thing after the deep dive, usually, yeah. in the episodes. But we'll include those in our episode notes just so that you have a chance if you're not going to be able to experience an Easter vigil this year to do some diving deeper and we're hoping that next year we'll have the timing and capacity shout out to our patreon supporters who help give us that capacity to do an a whole Easter vigil episode next year for you all so yeah keep your ears out for that and keep supporting us Absolutely. Oh, and when it comes to these readings, also, we will be doing the John reading for Easter as mm-hmm. well. So hang on until later this episode, and you will hear us talk about that reading, too. Yes, we'll do both Luke and John. And now it is time for our readings. And Yay. in good Easter fashion, there are lots of them, and you probably won't hear them all. The Acts reading is probably going to replace either Isaiah or 1 Corinthians. And then you'll probably hear either Luke or John. We don't know. That's just kind of the discretion of whoever's planning and leading worship. Yeah. But, yeah. So, the first reading option is Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. The prophet announces God's plan of renewal for heaven and earth which will do away with reasons for mourning, bring peace, and give all people a life of plenty. So one of the themes in this passage is quality of life. Isaiah is talking about the quality of life more so than necessarily the quantity of life, though that does get a mention as well. And I was talking to my roommate, Matt, who is one of our listeners, and he was explaining Star Trek to me. So, fair warning, I don't know Star Trek, feel free to correct me. <laughs> but the idea behind Star Trek is that their technology and stuff has advanced so much that machines and robots can do a lot of the more logistical work of running something. So, cleaning, taking care of people's needs, growing food, all of those things. And so then people have the opportunity to explore more. There's not, like scarcity of food that or resources yeah. that sort of thing so they get a better quality of life through technology i'm a luddite so i don't always believe that that is possible and these days i don't think technology is necessarily helping us it's helping a certain certain few billionaires but 
I like the idea of Star Trek of like, we're exploring because we have our basic needs met. So yeah. maybe this is actually an argument for a universal basic income. Very possible. Absolutely. In fact, in the Federation in Star Trek, it's made very clear that there are no poor people because everyone does have their universal needs met. Uh, basically. And they contrast that with other types of communities and social systems. Mm-hmm. So, uh, And then in verse 22, we read, They shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. So I have mentioned Jorts the Cat and his pro-union <laughs> Twitter account before on this podcast, but one of my favorite things about him is that he continually refuses to sell merch for himself, although many, many, many people have asked him to. Uh, and so if you want Jorts merch, he will tell you that you can adopt a shelter cat. doesn't have to be an orange one like him, but it could be. Or you can donate to a union fund, or you can write I like jorts on something you already own with an orange marker. He suggests those and also shares uh, links to shelter cats who are available for adoption and links to union funds that you can donate to on a regular Mm. basis. Nice. But recently he found, or someone probably sent him, a jorts-themed journal available for sale on Amazon. And he posted Mm -hmm. that he was sad about it because a little kid could be working for starvation wages making those things. Especially if it's Amazon. Exactly. He uh, he specifically said he does not want Jeff Bezos to make money off of his picture. And uh, so that is both true and also directly goes against this verse, which is pretty clear that the Bible is in favor of people being able to benefit from their own work. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so we can link to that tweet. Uh, but please, if you see the George Journal on Amazon, don't buy it. Yeah, that's fair. In verse 25, we read, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the becoming one. So this is not the interpretation that twilight has of (laughs) the lion falling in love with the lamb um it is not about falling in love and this one unlike twilight has the carnivore no longer being carnivorous yes so the lamb is protected the ox is protected because carnivorous animals are no longer going to try to kill or harm them yes which is important Also, if you want more or to understand why Twilight is on my mind so much, check out Horror Nerds at Church because we've got two of our Twilight episodes up. A third will be up next week. Cool. Okay. Our next reading for Easter is from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Simon Peter, gathered at a Gentile house, delivers the elevator speech of Christianity, explaining God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit in a nutshell. One of the themes for this passage is the idea of witness. What is the role of a witness? For Simon Peter, the witness is to share the news. In our reality, at least theoretically, the witness is there to tell the truth about something that happened, which is pretty similar to Peter's. In fiction, the role of the witness is actually frequently misdirection. Whether it's intentional on the part of the witness, where it's written into the character that the character is trying to mislead, or it's a device used by the author to misdirect the reader. Who knows? But Peter is probably doing the reality-based one more than the fiction-based one. Probably. You know. I would hope that while giving the elevator speech of Christianity, you wouldn't be trying to misdirect people. You don't want the elevator to go to the wrong place. (laughs) You never know. And also, yes, (laughs) please don't send them on the wrong elevator. And then in verse 36, we read, You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. This reminded me of the Ember in the Ashes series. So there's like the lineage of emperors and all of that stuff. But there's also a way to proclaim someone as emperor who maybe was not in the regular lineage. And so you, like, do it by shouting Imperator Invictus multiple times. And so that is, in fact, how Helene becomes, spoilers, the Emperor, because Quinn does that as a, like, support for her. And there's also, like, an evil person that does it. But this, so this reminded me of it, because whenever we name Jesus as Lord, it is directly an affront to Caesar as Lord. So it is an anti-Empire thing. 
Yeah, I would also say that it kind of sounds like in that world, the, you know, shoutiest people wind up getting to choose the emperor, which sounds very I mean, familiar, it, doesn't it? It can't be, so. it can't be, so it's actually a little bit better than that. It has to be like sure a there are rules. group thing. It, yeah. Like, it doesn't actually really happen, except that they're like... So you the, need a bunch of shouty people. Yeah, the lineage <laughs> has like basically ceased, like the emperor didn't have any kids, and so this is like sure. starting a new reign of empireness emperors something and then in verse 39 we read we are witnesses to all that he did both in judea and in jerusalem they put him to death by hanging him on a tree and i have to say there will always be a part of me that will hear any reference to the crucifixion particularly ones that mention it as a tree and uh, immediately the echo of douglas adams comment from the fourth hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy book will wander through my head in search of something to connect with uh, in which uh, adams who was very much an atheist himself summed up jesus's story as one man had been nailed to a tree for saying how great it would be to be nice to people for a change <laughs> which i mean okay yeah there's a lot more going on than that but also remarkably yeah. concise uh, yeah <laughs> Yeah. I didn't realize there was more than one Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy trilogy has five books. Naturally. Yes, I said it that way on purpose. Yep. Naturally. Mm -hmm. I like it. I'm a big fan of books one through four. Book five has a slightly different feel to it, and it's not bad. It's just different, I think. But Gotcha. Our next optional <laughs> reading. All, all readings are optional. Actually, like, listen, yeah. it's Easter. Just have a trumpet and you'll be fine. I was going to say, they're all optional except for like the Acts reading, which is kind of funny. Kind of ironic. Yeah. yeah. Okay, our next reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 19 through 26. Paul explains that Christ's victory over death will lead to the final destruction of death and that all will be made alive in Christ. So a particularly obvious theme in this passage is the idea of life over death, that life conquers death. And I could not help but think about the show Westworld, which I was watching and then got distracted by Buffy and Angel because of horror nerds at church and will return to again. But there's AI in Westworld, artificial intelligence, that keep getting killed because it's part of the like entertainment experience or whatever. And so they are eternally experiencing death and then grow in their own conscience and actually end up moving into life. And there's this like point that we're at right now where it's like, are they alive? Like, do they actually have a spark of conscience that they can, they can act on their own and without like all of the programming and all of the stuff that um, humans have kind of forced into them. Right. It's fascinating and so pretty violent. I feel like there's a parallel there with Muppets. Because, um, because Muppets think for themselves? Yes. Well, there is a conceit in all Muppet productions that, of course, the Muppets uh, speak for themselves. Of course, the Muppets act on their own initiative. Uh, they are they are doing their own thing. They are totally not being like piloted and uh, <laughs> voiced by human beings uh, because that would be silly. Why would you have a show about Muppets that can't actually talk for themselves? And so true. you know the Muppets are yeah. There's a little connection. I would wager that it's uh, it's a less a violent. slight stretch, but yeah. And then in verse 24 we read. Then comes the end when Jesus hands over the reign to God, the caregiver, after Jesus has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. And this one reminded me of the quote, power tends to corrupt, absolute power corrupts absolutely, which I discovered comes from the 19th century English historian Lord Acton who was writing in a, in a letter to Bishop Mandel Creighton about how historians should judge the abuse of power by past rulers, especially popes. So I just like it because it's a challenge. It makes it clear that like the thing that Jesus is destroying are the ones that are power and oppression and oppressive power. I also find it interesting that it's a rich white guy who notices that, yes, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. of all people. I was surprised. Maybe that's a sign about how obvious it is, I'm just saying. Or maybe also somebody else 
noticed it but didn't have like the wealth and all of that stuff to like write it down and keep it forever very possible uh and then in verse 26 we read the last enemy to be destroyed is death so death has been portrayed in a number of different ways uh over the years Mm -hmm. sometimes death is an enemy of course the one thing you absolutely must avoid sometimes death uh, i as i was recently reminded uh in the Discworld series uh death is sort of a guardian of humanity who finds (laughs) humanity interesting and kind of amusing uh, but doesn't really understand them and of course sometimes death comes as a a friend or as a adventure uh and this time I was particularly reminded of Albus Dumbledore's famous line, After all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. Mm. And, you know, you can't really have another great adventure if there is nothing after death. And so the true power of death, complete destruction, must have been destroyed, which is what today is about, you know, being Easter and all. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, I appreciate that even Albus Dumbledore seems to acknowledge that that an afterlife exists. And, of course, in the books, we get to see him there. Yeah. The irony, of course, being that he is the one who wrote that, presumably, on Harry's parents' graves. Yeah. The that that I'm referring to is the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Yeah. And then our first option for a gospel reading for Easter Sunday is from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. The women, returning to Jesus' tomb to anoint the body, find it empty, and they are told of the resurrection. They return to proclaim the gospel to the disciples who do not believe them, and Simon Peter finally goes to look for himself. So, one of the themes, as with every good gospel account of the resurrection, is women, also known as people who are not men. Those people who are not men is a larger category than just women. But I was thinking about this, and it comes up throughout but especially like verse 11 these words seemed to the disciples an idle tale and they did not believe them the the propensity for sexism and misogyny to just like discount women and the bible like kudos for actually naming that um out loud but it also reminded me of when i was in high school our youth group would play ultimate frisbee once a week and I was actually really good at catching frisbees. And so I would just like mosey on to the like end zone. And then my youth director would just like bomb the frisbee. And none of the guys would ever cover me because they would dismiss me because I was not a guy. And then we would score. It was great. It worked delightfully well. So... Ignore those who are not men at your own peril. As I'm sure many people listening to this podcast have probably learned for themselves. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. And if you want to share those stories with us, listeners, we would be delighted to hear them. And then uh, when we read verse 3, we read, But when they went in, they did not find the body. So slight mood change here i suppose Uh, as far as i'm aware this is the only time when the so they didn't find a body trope means that the son of god has been raised from the dead in order to provide humanity with eternal life Uh, usually not finding the body just means that the person never died in the first place Mm -hmm. they may have intentionally faked their own death maybe the body was like eaten by let's gloss that whole thing over but something or carefully disposed of in a unusual way Uh, but there is a whole trope on tvtropes.org which is still one of my uh, easiest websites to lose huge amounts of time in (laughs) uh, called never found the body Uh, and there are all kinds of different uh, shows books and uh, various other storytelling methods that have used that trope that you can find there Hmm. spoilers we're going to talk about that again Okay. And then in verse 4, we read, While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. So the women are perplexed, and all of a sudden there is an appearance, kind of like in the Matrix, of like the materializing of humans, maybe not through zeros and ones, but through glitter? <laughs> but it sounds pretty legit. Or the transporter effects in Star Trek uh, also look remarkably like glitter. I was thinking Sparkly that, lights. but I don't know Star Trek well enough, as previously sure. mentioned in this episode. Especially in the, the original series. But mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then our other gospel option for this episode is John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. 
Mary Magdalene discovering Jesus' empty tomb is believed by Peter and the disciple Jesus loved, who then look for themselves and leave. She stays and has a conversation with two angels, and then Jesus, who she at first mistakes for a gardener until Jesus calls her by name. So, in classic horror movie style, or movie tropes, (laughs) if there's no body, they're not dead. This is true for Jesus. (laughs) <laughs> true for Laya's mom in the Ember in the Ashes series when she just wants to see her mom and she doesn't go back and she never looks for the body she wouldn't have found one if she had Sure. this is also like decidedly different from real life situations where there is no body because that is probably because there are cover ups and yeah. the person who did the crime probably works for some sort of state or government or very mafia. possibly I'm sure one day we'll figure out whatever happened to Jimmy Hoffa but, you know, I don't know who not that right is. now. The, one of the most famous never found the body uh, cases in America. Oh. Um, a teamster, actually, who vanished Ooh. off the face of the earth. And yeah. Gotcha. From like the 70s, I think. I was thinking of Argentina and the military dictatorship where disappear became a that too. Yeah. verb that happens to people. Yeah. And then in verses 6b to 7, we read Simon Peter saw the linen wrappings lying there. And the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Which raises the question, who made the bed? Did the (laughs) angels make the bed? Did Jesus make the bed? Who made this bed that the, like, cloth and linens are all, like, folded and rolled up nice and neat? I have to say, if Jesus made the bed, I think that officially qualifies Mary as the world's number one mom, and she should have the requisite (laughs) coffee mug. Because presumably she's the one who taught him to do that. Mm -hmm. I would also, however, bring up that there is this, you know, mysterious gardener who we never see. And maybe (laughs) that's who did it. I'm sure. Right after rolling the stone away. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm I'm not necessarily saying he has to work that hard. But maybe he showed up and, oh, look, huh, there's all this mess here. Maybe I should clean that up. And then he went away and and... continued gardening. Yeah, Yeah, totally. That makes lots of sense. (laughs) And then in verse 15, we read, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where they have laid him, and I will take him away. So what kind of gardeners is Mary familiar with who apparently rob tombs and take dead bodies? Like, this is what she expects the gardener (laughs) to have done. This is more believable to her than Jesus coming back from the dead after Jesus had said several times that, by the way, I'm coming back from the dead. I mean, he said it a little bit more cryptically than that. Well, yes, it it depends on which gospel you're reading. And also, he might not have said that directly to Mary, because why would you tell women that in back then? Mm -hmm. Although I would hope that Jesus would be a little less misogynist than the people around him. He's usually pretty good at that. Yeah. But I'm just saying, like, if this is Mary's baseline expectation of gardeners to have, you know, stolen dead bodies, uh, (laughs) presumably in the middle of the night... Is is she a member of the Adams family? Like, what kind of background <laughs> does Mary have? Is my question, because like the Adams family is really the only explanation I've got for reasons you would expect gardeners to have that as part of their job description, and immediately go to that option. So, yeah, agreed. And now we welcome you to the most recent addition to our podcast, the Let's Make a Muppets Musical section, where we look at the readings that we've talked about and talk about recasting these readings with Muppets and the occasional token human to be reenacted uh, in our eventual Muppet-based Bible musical that I'm sure we will get off the ground one of these days. (laughs) And today, of course, we have lots of options because we did discuss the Easter Vigil before discussing Easter. I would say for the Easter Vigil, my biggest wish would be that Jonah should be eaten by a giant Muppet whale, but Jonah should be played by a person so that the Muppet whale has to be that enormous. I'm not really sold on what color the Muppet whale should be, but definitely not a color found in nature. Well, I think also the Muppet, I think it should be an ambiguous fish. Uh, yes, yeah, it's right, it's a sea creature, right? It's not technically a whale. Because be you can't have queer, the baleen uh, whale yeah. teeth. Yeah, to be perfectly queer, whale is not in the book of Jonah. That word, not in the book of Jonah. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I think that would be glorious to have a ginormous Muppet fish eat a human Jonah. Maybe it could be some one of the Jonas brothers. I- <laughs> 
<laughs> that could be fabulous, absolutely. Also, a lot of various sea creatures have skin that sort of Shimmer. looks... Yeah, it shimmers. It, it sort of has a multicolored effect to it. It's not that the skin itself is multicolored, but it's the like way it reflects light really is kind of rainbowish. And therefore, <gasps> the this could be a tie-dyed... Ooh! I'm just saying. Giant tie-dyed sea creature eats Jonah. I absolutely love that. Excellent. Fantastic. I was thinking about it, and I think the creation story would actually be great with all Muppets, no humans. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Unless the humans don't enter into it until the very end anyway, and let's be honest, important? we kind of ruin everything. So. And they could easily be Muppets anyway. Yes. Yeah. Or, or the humans in the creation story are played by Muppets, and all of the other creation things are played by humans wearing, like, tree costumes, or, like, really, really low-market tree costumes, or cloud costumes, or sea costumes. I don't know how, maybe wave costumes, or weird little mountain costumes. That's brilliant. I actually was thinking about that as we were talking about it, because I was like, yeah, you're supposed to have a human, at least, and yeah, having, like, a human be the tree, or, like, just a human just being the wind, right? Like, just going... <sighs> <laughs> yes. Actually, it occurs to me that once we actually produce our, you know, famous Muppets Bible musical, all of those various things could be portrayed by the production cast. It, they wouldn't have to be famous humans. They could be uh, all of the people in, ba in the background who would like to actually have a part in the in the mm. thing. Uh, they could be a cloud or a mountain or the wind or something. Yeah, yeah, that is brilliant. I think that Daniel yeah. also should be. Daniel would be great with Muppets. Well, particularly your felt flame idea, right? But like Muppet flames, you know, like singing yes. vegetables, but singing flames. Yeah. The, the flames would have little mouths that would sing at the very tip of the flame that, yes, absolutely, that's fantastic. And then to have the human be King Nebuchadnezzar, because that's just like, a, yes. the human is really good at being like the bad guy. I don't know yeah. who I would pick for King Nebuchadnezzar. But also like super over the top and like all of the possible ham and uh, wackiness and yeah, that. Yeah, who would be a really good, like, super over-the-top evil character? We know them. I mean, we can't get Alan Rickman. Sadly, yes. But if we could time travel, I'd pick Alan Rickman for sure. Absolutely. Because, like, let's be honest, a British accent probably helps with pulling off the evil mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. imperial kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Oh, you know. You know who I think would have a lot of fun with it, but we'd have to do a gender bend cast. I'm Nicole sorry. Kidman. Ooh. I think she would absolutely have a glorious time. Oh my gosh, she's so good at being evil. The... Yes, and she can do the X. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I like it. Sure. When it comes to the Luke reading, I think that gospel reading is the one where the men do not believe the women. And it, it's not just one man not believing one woman. It, this is several women show up and talk to several men, and the several men decide that the women must be making it up. And there are two ways I would go with this. Mm -hmm. Either the, like one group has to be Muppets and one group has to be humans, I guess. As, yeah. as, unless like, or like the leader of one group has to be a human and then all of the others will be Muppets. Yeah. And I'm thinking that the leader of the women being human and not being believed by the Muppets would probably be funnier than the other way around. Because otherwise you've got like a, a guy there who is not believing. And that, that just seems rude. Yeah, it seems, it seems more punching up to like make the men Muppets who don't believe the woman. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I was so, trying to figure that out too. I was like, either way, complicated. Yeah. But yeah, I agree. And like the the women can like there can be a human person and then also like several female muppets like i'm totally miss piggy could absolutely karate chop a couple of these guys when they're not paying attention <laughs> i'm up for that janice can be there and and like sing at them there are a bunch on sesame street too that's where yes. they've had like the most diversity of muppets i wonder hang on some of some There's of the sesame street folks that i'm thinking oh of. oscar the grouch definitely needs to be on the guy's side yes i was thinking julia also Who's one of the Muppets? Yes. Um, on Sesame sure. Street? Bert and Ernie could be on the guy's side and be so busy arguing with each other that they don't notice the women at all. Uh -huh. But as for who should be the human woman, I'm kind of thinking like a little older and like someone that 
we would have a real difficulty believing that anyone wouldn't pay attention to because I mean, like listen if this person shows up in your life you're you're noticing and my first thought was julie andrews i think julie andrews would be really good um i was also thinking who plays mrs potts on beauty and in beauty and the beast who voices her oh angela lansbury yeah i was thinking angela lansbury yes so we went very similar directions just not exactly mm-hmm. yeah. Angela Lansbury had so much fun doing remarkably Muppet-like things in Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, too. So, like, not actual Muppets, but it it was uh, a similar vibe. Or Octavia Spencer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that could be fabulous. Absolutely. Yep. That would bring, I think, a whole nother yes. depth to it. Because also I feel like Julie Andrews or Angela Lansbury would be tempted to tell Miss Piggy to not karate chop people. And I don't think it, Octavia Spencer would have that problem. <laughs> I mean, somehow. I I'm think saying, that Angela Lansbury... Like she's not actually hurting anyone. I think that Angela Lansbury actually would just let Miss Piggy go. Well, yeah. Julie Andrews yeah. a little uh, After a minute. More. Yeah. Or, well, okay, let's let's say Angela Lansbury would maybe encourage Miss Piggy to calm down at first and then notice that, no, really, the guys aren't paying attention, and then let her go. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for joining us. Catch us next time when we'll discuss nerdery connections to the scripture readings for the second Sunday of Easter. This podcast has been produced by us, Emily Ewing and Kay Rola. For more fun, check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Nerds at Church, or contact us at nerdsatchurch at gmail.com. Also, if you like what you've heard, rate us or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or wherever you catch your podcasts. If you want access to our uncut guest episodes and interviews, live Q&As, and more, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash nerdsatchurch. While the pandemic still rages, or while you're getting ready for your new summer outfits, don't forget that you can find some of our merch at our merch store, which we share with Horror Nerds at Church. You can find that at bit.ly slash nerds at church merch so make sure you check that out and get your favorite mask in any of the liturgical colors plus we've got so many great readings we only talked about four of them for let's make a muppets musical so let us know on facebook or twitter who you would cast if you were casting a muppets musical for this episode as the ancient christians said pox Pox obiscum. obiscum